Chapter 1. Welcome to Fearless Change. Change is one of those experiences in life that either makes a dramatic entry or creeps up on you and before you know it, things are different. Sometimes we take a leap to go with its movement or stay steadfast in our ways. The spirit of change sends subtle signals. We begin to feel uncomfortable, have intuitive hunches or distinct fears, dreams of premonition, feelings of creativity or awareness. We sometimes feel we are out of step with the world. Change doesn't evolve like we think it should, but it does evolve for our highest good to help us in the development of our souls. To struggle and resist brings suffering, guilt, anger, and sadness. To accept change and surrender to its greater strength brings peace. I invite you to see that the events of life are opportunities for us to find meaning and compassion as we learn effective ways to get our needs met. It takes an enormous amount of courage to overcome our sense of loss from death, divorce, injury, or illness. We develop patience, tolerance, determination, and vision as a result. We must put forth a continuous effort to integrate new ways of being with our emotions, our bodies, our dreams, and ourselves. As we discover the significance of the moment, we come closer to the silver thread that weaves its way through our days. This audiobook is an all-embracing view of the process of change. It will heighten your awareness and understanding of the many benefits of the power of choice. We make numerous changes each day as our world is not stagnant, but living and dynamic. Nature is always in a state of evolving and in the process tears down and seemingly destroys itself. Yet the vital renewal of life emerges and nature reconstructs herself through healing and growth. I refer to the process of recovery throughout this audiobook in a broad sense. To recover is to reclaim, recuperate, make progress, improve, mend, restore to health, or regain some aspect of that which was lost through change. Recovery applies not only to the process of how we heal from the effects of addictions, but how we adapt and recover our sense of self when we have experienced any type of loss. The goal of recovery is to improve our strength and gain in our wisdom. Fearless change refers to the spirit of change as either God, spirit, higher power, silent love, or the energy of creation. This spirit moves through life bringing treasures unknown, yet is itself formless and changeless. The spirit of change knows no religious or cultural boundaries. This spirit is everlasting and eternal. How can you best use this audiobook? By following the suggestions in Chapter 2, write down the change that is going on in your life now or a change that you want to make and think about how it is affecting you. Because change ripples throughout our consciousness, it is important to put a name on the change to begin getting a better sense of how to think about it. Next, as you are listening, write down the thoughts and feelings and reflections that come to your mind. You might also share those reflections with those close to you. Being able to see our fears, hurts, doubts, and excitement in a larger light is helpful on our path to finding joy. It is my hope that you will welcome the spirit of change as you embrace these fearless change choices in your everyday life. You will gain confidence knowing that you can create positive growth in any area of your life for the rest of your life. You will never fear change again. Chapter 1. Welcome to Fearless Change Change, it's one of those experiences in life that either makes a dramatic entry or creeps up on you and before you know it, things are different. Change can be initiated by us or visited upon us, both as a step in the growth of our soul. Either way, there are the subtle signals of our emergence forward. We may experience feeling uncomfortable, have intuitive hunches or distinct fears, dreams of premonition, feelings of creativity, movement, or an awareness of feeling stuck, as if we're out of step with the world. Well, when change arrives, we either go with it or try our best to resist its signs. Making an adaptation to a change in our families, work, relationships, or our health takes a continuous effort to learn and integrate new ways of being with our emotions, our bodies, our dreams, and ourselves. Changes are catalysts, the sparks to ignite the energy necessary in nature for us to mature, develop, and grow. 
whether the change you are currently going through in your life is about attachment or separation, gaining or losing, birth or death. They each bring deep and powerful human experiences as they are natural aspects of living in this physical world. Change can appear as an illness, injury, a death, or some other type of physical loss, such as menopause. It can arrive as a setback in your career or a feeling of growing disenchantment with your work. Other changes are more conscious, such as attempting to diet or change our food habits. At other times, change appears as the realization that a parent, partner, friend, child, or coworker is addicted to a substance or a dysfunctional thought process. At other times, change awakens us with startling realization that we are abusing or addicted to a chemical such as nicotine, alcohol, prescription, or illegal drugs. Change also emerges into our consciousness when we or our family or friends divorce, remarry, separate from a partner, family, or friends develop new religious or spiritual views, or go in and out of recovery. Change occurs when we have surgery or are diagnosed with an illness. Change begins as we start a creative project, when we experience a shift in our financial condition, have surgery, fall in love, move, graduate, start a family, or when the children leave home. Whatever, however, whenever change is manifesting in your life, know that within the words of these tapes you will discover essential tools to transform the way you look at the experience of being alive. You will focus on the positive possibilities to create joy and fulfillment. The Fearless Change Map, which is included in the audio booklet, is your guide to fearless change. I've developed it over the years of working with clients and myself to understand the impact of change on our consciousness. Study it, know it, and use it. At all times and in all situations, you will find yourself somewhere on either the path of trust or the path of fear. The goal is to live as many days as you can on the path of trust, enjoying life, fielding change with grace and dignity. Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, The great thing in this world is not so much where we are, but in what direction we are moving. In the early 70s, I was married, had a big house, and was just settling into the domestic scene. I was in my 20s and working at a job that paid well. I started putting money into a retirement account, bought life insurance and property on which to build a retirement home. I was just waiting to start my family. Everything seemed to be going according to my schedule. Then the spirit of change arrived on the scene. I first became aware of the power of change when my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer. She died five weeks later. Her illness had been going on for 40 years. She was addicted to cigarettes. I was devastated and in shock. I couldn't work or sleep. I wandered around in a daze, lost. I cried and sobbed whenever I thought of her. I felt as if my foundation had been blown apart. Everywhere looked like a cemetery. The family home was empty of her love and energy. The school where she taught eighth graders, which had seemed so alive and vibrant, now seemed desolate. And then the family pets died one after the other. More unexpected change arrived. Both my grandparents, with whom I was very close, died within 18 months of my mother's death. My grandmother, a gentle and sweet woman, loved me unconditionally. She, the light of my life, was gone. Grandpa, who was quiet, funny, and a wonderful role model of commitment and love, was no longer there to hear my adventures, to share apple pie and ice cream with, or to tell me not to take any wooden nickels. Gone were the family historians who knew about the early years and told stories of how we had evolved as a family. The feeling of loss was so overwhelming that an earlier back problem I had suddenly worsened. I was having difficulties working and went out on disability because of the physical pain. I was diagnosed as having an incurable pain problem in my spine and given a hysterectomy and an antiquated solution. Now there were no children to fill the empty rooms of the big house or to give life to the family tree. I felt suspended in space, severed from humanity. I didn't feel like I was a real woman. The way my father coped with his wife's death was to remarry, sell the family home, and move away. At first I felt glad he was moving on with his life until receiving a photocopied letter that was sent to my three brothers and I. It read, Now that your mother is dead and I have remarried, I will be spending time with her and her family. 
I wish you well in your life, Dad. I felt orphaned. There were no more birthday cards or parties, no more Christmas or Thanksgiving celebrations. I was on my own. I was struck by the differences in my life and that of my friends. Seven of them were healthy, pregnant, working, and had relatives all around. I tried to deny that my life at 28 was going to be very different, but I woke up one morning and decided to get a divorce, move out of town, go back to school, and start a new life. Some people said I snapped. Like my dad, I decided to let go completely of the old to free myself for a whole new beginning. I felt abandoned by life, and I, in turn, abandoned my life. I called a few friends and told them I was moving. I said goodbye to my mother-in-law and hugged my sobbing and confused husband. Packing up my yellow VW with my dog, clothes, my inheritance of family dishes, a few pieces of jewelry, a blanket from my grandfather, and one filled with the aroma of my mother's perfume, I left to start life again. I had no idea how it was going to unfold, and I was scared. I was leaving the structure my family and society had created for women. Get married, establish a home, have children, work part-time to fulfill yourself, retire, travel, grow old with your grandkids, and die. I was venturing into a new universe for myself. I was frightened and excited. I realized that I needed to find other ways to fulfill my needs for family, for vocation, for giving and receiving love, for a sense of belonging for trust, and, and to find personal expression. The bottom line was that I needed a reason to keep on living. I began to rethink the expectations I had about my mom and dad, what I believed I needed from them, and what I was going to miss. I knew my three brothers loved me, but, you know, they had their own lives. Whatever it was I thought I needed, it was certain that I wasn't going to get it from my family. I had to explore other ways to become whole again. I moved 50 miles away and enrolled in college. I found a roommate and started to explore this new beginning. Unpacking in my apartment, I had feelings of being reborn. I felt alive with energy all around me. There was a lot of action going on at the university I was attending. I met new people and became involved in the consumer rights movement. Everything was in change. I found myself rebelling against the established traditions of society. We demanded women's rights and signed our name as Ms., we hitchhiked across the United States and in Europe, took chances with our brains by using drugs, and risked our well-being through promiscuous sex as we welcomed in the sexual revolution. We rebelled against the taboos of the tribe. We were looking for new levels of emotional and spiritual awareness in response to the inner and outer turmoil. We used meditation, sensitivity groups, and drugs to reach for it. We wanted things to be different, and we were not afraid to do whatever it took to bring it about. Then things slowed down. We seemed to have reached a new equilibrium point in our society. We integrated the actions of only a few years earlier. The war in Vietnam was over, and our surviving men were returning home, wounded physically, emotionally, and spiritually, forever changed by the rules of war. Laws were enacted to protect consumers, and I put away my picket sign. I graduated from college, married again, changed my name, and traded my worn-out Levi's and Salvation Army t-shirt for a polyester pantsuit. I went to work in a corporate job and started teaching consumer economics in a local community college. It all seemed so prescribed and automatic to return to the framework of my earlier life. Now I was grieving the loss of the friends and experiences I had made during those years. Internally, I was reeling from the uprooting of my life and the unresolved grief and loss I had experienced as a result of the family deaths. I began to feel overwhelming fear, and I experienced panic attacks. My creative and emotional energies were depleted. I could feel powerful when I was angry at big business and the government, and when I thought I could make a difference saving the world— but when it came time to save myself, I gave up because I didn't know how or where to begin. I was passive. I didn't say what I felt. I didn't know what I felt. Instead, I tried to keep up a front that I was happy when in reality I was overwhelmed by life. Inside, I bottled up all the creative energy because I didn't know where or how to use it. I then became depressed and sick. I burned out and could do nothing. Now, I'm not the kind of person who sits around for long, but I was at a complete loss. 
I tried to be happy in spite of what was now going on with my body, but I knew I had to do something very different. I wanted to control the change by getting into the new, yet I had not fully grieved and let go of the multiple losses in my life. I was in total denial. The hot, searing physical pain I endured from the sciatica I had was now overwhelming with all of the pent-up emotions. My body began to shut down. I could barely walk across the room. The energy in my body seemed to come to a complete stop. More powerlessness. I felt helpless, depressed, and lost. There had to be a way out of this darkness. And it was at this point that I began to reinvent my life. I was talking to my friend Patty, and I told her how overwhelmed I felt. I realized through our conversation that I was scared most of the time. Wanting to get into the solution, we looked up fear in the dictionary to learn the antonym. Faith. Well, this was my answer. I then started reading about people whose trust and faith had helped them to open to healing. They had created powerful images and changes in their life by realizing that there was a choice to stay in their pain or learn to heal their thoughts and feelings. Those who had healed learned to accept the reality of the people and events in their lives rather than be unhappy over the unmet expectations for which they had been angry, sad, and resentful. They learned to forgive others. They learned to pray and trust the power of the universe. Most wrote of newly discovered aspects of themselves. Now, many of the people had strengthened despite what they'd been through. They had healed their lives, their bodies, finances, and their relationships. All of the people I read about learned to love and forgive themselves unconditionally, regardless of what others had said or done to them. Those who healed had quit judging and comparing themselves with others and accepted the limitations of being human with love and grace. They told themselves they were healthy and whole and spent time visualizing the light of love surrounding every aspect of their bodies. The books challenged me to focus on God, the spirit of creation, rather than any specific problem. After I explored the many facets of healing, studied spiritual and motivational books, listened to meditation tapes, prayed, and attended services to learn the multiple ways people honor the power and presence of God in their lives, I began changing my perceptions too. I became mindful of life all around me, aware of the present moment. I decided to become fully conscious each morning as I went about getting out of bed, brushing my teeth, and preparing and eating my breakfast. I brought my full awareness to each step I took, each time I lifted my hands and had a thought. I said aloud, I am aware that my left foot is touching the ground. I am aware that my right foot is touching the ground. I am aware that I'm picking up the cup. I am aware that I'm pouring the water. I began to feel the presence of spirit in the work I did, the way I took a breath, and the way I moved. I began to increase my awareness of many things that had previously been ignored because I'd been somewhat unconscious. I learned that I could change the words I said to myself, which could change how I felt. When I recalled memories, I could reframe them to feel differently. Then I could change my outlook on life. Changing one word in my inner dialogue changed my attitude. Instead of thinking of painful or fearful outcomes, I began to think the word faith. I made the choice to become aware of the laws of the universe that I trusted. I could trust the sun to come up, that rain would be water and not oil, that if I dropped something it would fall. With my trust strengthened, I then learned about assertiveness, which means to ask nicely and directly for what I want. When I learned that I had to ask for what I wanted and needed in relationships with men, I was really upset. I somehow thought that if a man really loved me, he should know what I needed and what was best for me. If he got it right, then it must be true love. And if he got it wrong, it meant he didn't love me and I stayed empty. In reality, I felt helpless and didn't know how to ask. I could shout and demand aggressively for the rights of others, yet I had not been taught to ask for myself. I thought asking was selfish, and for a long time I denied asking for many of my needs. I couldn't ask for what I didn't know I needed. I also learned that my higher power was the one who really loved me, totally and unconditionally. I realized that when I trusted spirit, my need was met even if I didn't know what to do or what I needed. I would listen deeply and trust the answer to unfold, 
As the understanding came, I began to interpret the messages of pain, tension, and coincidences. I was open to inner guidance in the form of intuition or a nudge in some direction. I learned to forgive each judgment I had toward another, in the present and in my past. I was able to ask this all-powerful spirit for everything I needed. I would take action, believing the need would be fulfilled in some way as long as I listened to my inner promptings and maintained my faith and perseverance. Daily, for months, I visualized this light of light, fire and destruction and creation, moving in and through my body and mind. I affirmed in my waking thoughts and out loud that my body was revived with strength and healing. Eventually, the words and feelings were submerged into my subconscious, and I began to have calm and pain-free days, dreams of peace and feelings of strength. It worked! At last I could find the calm center of my being and experience being pain-free. At first it was only for a few fleeting minutes, then for longer periods of time. I was starting to feel stronger and healthier, just as I had affirmed. I had successfully moved my perception from fear to trust on the right-hand side of the chart. And with fear there was darkness and weakness, depression and pain. And with trust I experienced light, strength, vision, and new beginnings. I began to research how my experiences could help others. After becoming a therapist and talking to literally thousands of people over the years in therapy, workshops, and on the radio, I realized that other people had the same problem I did. I wasn't alone. I have since used the Fearless Change map with clients in therapy and in workshops. Now, this map will help you in the same way it's helped them to understand the elements of anger, change, powerlessness, boundaries, communication, and a multitude of other issues. The Fearless Change map is a mirror of your inner self. You can see where you're headed and where you want to be. Use it as your compass. Trust in the journey of fearless change. You see, our basic needs are interdependent upon our environment, including the universe of people, places, and things, time, and the energy of creation. The fulfillment of these needs within our lives is based on our ability to effectively communicate to this universe through our verbal and nonverbal interactions. The cycle of meeting our needs goes unnoticed for the most minute changes and movements we make each day. If we trust our abilities and the possibilities within the universe to get our needs met, we approach change with trust. We accept what is in front of us, we cooperate with it, and take the necessary actions. We have satisfied our need and met our soul's requirement to grow and expand. If, on the other hand, we resist change and growth, it may be because we have unrealistic expectations of who we are or how our lives ought to be. We may feel disappointment, shame, or guilt because our bodies, our relationships, children, jobs, or investments don't respond like we think they should. The characteristics we have in our personality exemplify the beliefs, expectations, and perceptions we have developed through our relationships, families, and communities. These characteristics protect our most inner vulnerable self and have their foundation in our prior experiences, values, personality type, families of origin, and soul purpose. When we have a fearful or anxious perspective and we become defensive and rigid either internally or externally, we may try to shut down our emotions, and we, if we do, we will become ill, get depressed, rage, or relapse. We propel ourselves into emotional or physical burnout. When we act out our defensiveness externally, we become angry, irritable, blaming, sarcastic, or manipulative. Many people show the passive side to the world and internalize the fears, blame, and rage. Well, the more quickly we choose to reframe the negative beliefs into positive, empowering thoughts, the sooner our trust returns and we can accept and cooperate with the change at hand. We then access our creative instincts and seek a solution. Now, some solutions come quickly and others take months or even years depending upon the expectations of the new or the depth of pain and trauma one has experienced. Reframing the change through our thoughts, words, breathing, and actions allows us to collect our thoughts, imagine a positive outcome, and accept what is in front of us right now. Think about a major change going on in your life today. Locate your position on the map, then decide which process you want to be in the problem, or the solution. Follow the guidance in this audiobook and allow yourself to be reinvented 
through the path to fearless change. Chapter 2, Facing the Unknown Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, Do not follow where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. One thing for certain is that when there is change, we must face that unknown. Do you feel anxious when you think of making changes or when you face the unknown? Or do you feel fear that other people's changes may affect you? Well, some changes we can influence and others we have no control over and still others we try to avoid. When our expectations have been challenged and we are not the one making the decisions, we can feel little and helpless or kick and scream because we feel we have no control over the direction in our lives. Or we can choose to see changes that others bring as a reflection of our inner growth and use the power of our thoughts and choices to make decisions that empower us. Either way, we must realize we have chosen experiences and relationships to give our soul challenges and opportunities to develop. Then, when we have gained what we need to learn, our soul urges us in its own way to move on. Facing the unknown, I was learning from my experiences that if I have a deep desire for things to be different in my life, I must first accept reality just as it is. Now, reality is devised by the expectations we have of it, and we usually have no awareness of these rules that guide our lives until they're changed. I examined the impact of my fear of poverty, of criticism, and of ill health on my perception of reality. I realized the fear of being abandoned by my mother had become real, and I worried about my own old age and death. In some situations, we expect the best, and other times we expect the worst. When we are aware of what we are thinking, including our expectations and fears, we can constructively direct our thoughts, actions, and responses into the void of the unknown. I realize that when I'm needy, it is my responsibility to discover beneficial ways to validate my self-worth, sense of belonging in the world, self-respect, and feelings of universal love. Otherwise, I depend on other people or situations in my life to make me feel whole. When I give someone or something else the power to make me feel complete, something that I already am, I sacrifice an aspect of my personal worth in return. If I believe that it wouldn't be nice for me to get my way, say no or get angry, I have given up a sense of my power, the voice I use to ask for what I want, need, set limits, and protect my values and vulnerability. To reinvent ourselves as we go through change is to redesign our self-concept. We can help give ourselves the necessary strength by identifying what we're thinking and turning it around to be a prayerful and positive thought. When we stay conscious and aware of our needs, thoughts, words, feelings, and actions, we are able to respond from our higher self and move with grace. Opportunities reveal themselves. We're invited to have new experiences, and we willingly say yes to the new leg of our life adventure. We begin to see ourselves differently as we try new roles, take on different responsibilities, and see life from a perspective of living fully, detached from the pain or shame of the past or the approval of others. Change is a natural event, the dynamic force of life itself. Our lives are in constant change as we adapt and adjust in our powerlessness over controlling the flow in this great universe. Our only real power is our response to the change. Take a moment now and think of a change you overcame in the past and what you did to rebalance and grow through the process. Remember, you wouldn't be here if you hadn't been there. See, I bet you made it through that change, and with confidence. With the keys of fearless change, you will face this current unknown, too, and discover a positive and creative solution no matter what you're experiencing. Take the time now to reflect on the depth of a transformation going on in your life. We need to form a relationship with the change if we're going to manage it and move to the next phase. You see, change has a rippling effect. It impacts other areas of our lives and the lives of those close to us. You may be in several changes at the same time, and if so, take a few minutes to yourself and think about the one that has been the most challenging to embrace right now. Get clear on how to describe it. Then, if you choose to, open up the workbook enclosed in this audio tape and write a bit about the change you are going through right now. What excites you most about the change?
What do you fear most about this change? Now think about a time in the past when you experienced a significant change. How did you move beyond it to rebalance your life? And what was the gift of that change? What do you think this current change is here to teach you about yourself and about others? What do you think you need to do to move from feeling fear to trusting the outcome inherent in the change? By fully thinking about the change with these insights, you will immediately begin to see change from a new perspective. Learning fearless change choices will enable you to face the unknown with confidence. Chapter 3. What We Believe Coupled with our new awareness, we now look into our beliefs to see the direction we are headed. What we believe impacts every area of our life. Our beliefs are gathered and synthesized through our connections with our families, partners, children, friends, workplaces, and neighborhoods. We then reveal these characteristics and behaviors in our day-to-day -day experiences as we interact in relationship with people and situations. Some of us were raised to develop fear, pain, and shame characteristics, while at other times we had experiences and developed characteristics which were based in trust, love, and pleasure. Ellen was raised with much shame and guilt, and as a result she feels jealous and suspicious, is mistrusting and giving affection, and sees life as chaotic and unsafe. In Ellen's chaotic and unsafe family, she believed that God was punishing and judgmental, so she learned to feel unrealistic guilt. As a result, she projects and resists change as it seems too unsettling for her. She never set many goals as she would rather not hope for something better than to be disappointed once again. George, her partner, on the other hand, had been raised with parents who were unconditionally loving and would trust without thinking much and be more openly affectionate. He believed God was unconditionally loving and that life was in divine order. He felt his innocence rather than his guilt. He saw mistakes as opportunities for learning, whereas Ellen saw mistakes as failures. George was open to the new and different and was often setting goals to motivate himself. He was feeling positive about the direction he was headed in his career, yet he and Ellen were experiencing more and more conflicts in their relationship. Their problems grew out of their differences, and when George was tired of Ellen's negativity, he called me for counseling. As they both looked over the list of trusting or fearful beliefs and characteristics, Ellen was able to identify the limited beliefs she had developed. Through her commitment to heal, she was able to let go of her old way of thinking and make the choice to relanguage her thoughts and characteristics with words and actions of trust and faith. When we understand the patterns of thought and actions that bind us to the old way of being, we are truly free to grow. As we shift our thinking, feelings, and energy from fearful characteristics which we learned in the past to trusting words, images, and ideas, we move the flow of energy in our lives from negative to positive. I used to live my life from fear-based characteristics, and I was controlling and resentful and ill, just like the fearful side of the fearless change map. I interpreted life from the messages and experiences I had known. As I look around my life today, I am filled with amazement that it is so full and satisfying. I have so much to be grateful for since I've begun to discover and experience my own potential. Now, these things didn't just happen to appear in my life. It is only since I changed the way I believe that any of this has become manifest. I realized I had choices, that I was not helpless or a victim. As I embraced growth, I learned to feel trust and began to be more cooperative, understanding, and fulfilled. The first change was learning to believe in a higher power. Through acting as if I could trust, I learned to have faith. I have become so much more understanding of my feelings now, and I know that I have the choice to create positive and trusting thoughts and images in my mind. Now, partners, families, and communities, they teach us how to ask or not ask for help from them. Our spiritual groups and churches show us how to ask God for help through our prayers of petition and affirmation. In support groups, people give out their phone numbers. Here's my phone number. Give me a call if you want. When Rosemary gave me her phone number, it opened up a wonderful and rich vein of new friends and experiences. 
When others give us what we ask for, it reinforces our ability to get our needs met and develops inner trust in ourselves and affirms that we are safe. Each time we are able to work cooperatively with another, we strengthen our interdependence and our trust. Now, in the early part of my healing, I didn't believe in God. I was afraid most of the time as I ventured out into the new. I worried that I was unloved, I would burn the dinner, or get into a car accident. I didn't trust anything or anybody, and the images in my mind were less than beautiful. I realized I had been scared for a very, very long time, and I didn't want to feel the pain or the depression again or use substances to cover up the fear because it had been so awful. Seeking a relationship with the inner aspect of myself, that part of me that was deep inside and untouched by the events of my life, seemed the only way out. Growing up, I didn't ever remember believing in God except once when I got caught stealing some makeup. My mother told me to ask Jesus for forgiveness. I did, and I felt so much better. But getting help from others was not a belief that was encouraged in my family, as asking didn't produce positive results. I learned to do many things on my own. I didn't even ask God for help with other things until I wanted help with getting free of my addictions. Even though I had changed my outsides, I realized my insides were feeling the same old feelings because I was thinking the same old thoughts. One day I felt trapped more than ever in a pattern of hopelessness. I kept thinking about the way my life should have been, if only this and that would or wouldn't have happened. To get out of the depression, I was trying to find motivation to meet new friends and leave the past behind, but I couldn't get myself up and out of the house. I began to create a vision for my life that would give me a reason to keep on living, a purpose that would give me enthusiasm for getting up in the morning. I would come up with great ideas and I'd be so filled with enthusiasm and hope for a few hours and then I'd drop into despair about the course my life had taken. Other people seemed to have had an easier journey along the way. Frankly, everyone else seemed happier. I could see no purpose for myself in the future. I wasn't in a relationship, and even though I was working again and praying, there was something missing. I felt guilty much of the time and shameful for just being me. I was talking to some friends who were further down the spiritual road, and they challenged me to be more positive and open my mind to the unlimited possibilities in life. They helped me to understand that my higher power was not punishing me, but that I was not allowing this power to help me grow in my everyday life. They challenged my beliefs in fear, negativity, and futility, which were keeping me trapped. I'd settled into a church, and I made an appointment with the minister to see if he could give me some further guidance. He invited me to attend a workshop presented by C. Norman Sheely, M.D., the first president of the American Holistic Health Association. Dr. Sheely, who ran a pain center, was quite well known for his books on the power of the mind to heal chronic pain and illness. I was a bit skeptical at first, as seven physicians and surgeons had told me there was absolutely nothing that could be done to eliminate the pain in my spine. Yet, when I talked with Dr. Sheely, he looked me straight in the eye and said, You can use your mind to heal your body. I knew he was telling me the truth. I had to look more deeply at the limiting beliefs I held about my ability to create a pain-free body as well as a fulfilling life for myself. What I learned is that if I only see what is right with me, I only see what is right with other people or situations. When I see the negative or unloved aspects of myself, my body, or identify imperfections in myself and criticize them, I am living in my historical fear-based belief system. When I judge others, I am judging myself because they are mirrors of me. What I like or dislike, do or don't want to be, have or don't have in my life, is reflected back to me through my perceptions. In some situations, I am jealous and filled with envy. In others, my love pours out like the mouth of a river. I began to understand that I had unconsciously absorbed qualities and characteristics, reactions and feelings from my experiences growing up and living in the world. During my meditation, I visualized the pure light within me, burning up the old belief that I couldn't have love, family, and prosperity. This freed me to start each day choosing positive thoughts and responses, and gave me insight to ask the universe for fulfillment of my desires. I was beginning to understand that if we don't ask, we don't get. I affirmed I would be successful in creating a life filled with love and meaning. I examined my beliefs about conditional and unconditional love. I loved myself conditionally, 
There was frequently the little dig I said when I didn't do something perfectly or felt deprived. I needed to give up judgmental words in my thinking, and I began to replace my thoughts of judgment with words of acceptance. Our inner voice can create feeling joyful or being inwardly accepting, forgiving and enthusiastic about events and people in our lives. Feeling unconditional love toward myself makes it easier for me to see the world as safe. Creating new experiences in my life was also tied to beliefs of success or failure. Don't dream, the parents would say. Don't ask. There isn't enough money. I could either give up or find a creative way without money to make something happen. I learned to be resourceful and found jobs in the neighborhood, made new clothes out of remnants and recycled items, and used my imagination in many different ways. The worst feeling for me is when I have doubt about my creative ability to manifest my dreams. In the past, I would start making up plans B and C. Now, this style of self-negotiation is okay for some things. However, when denying an element of our soul's development, it can have a significant impact on our life. Choosing plan B or C with regards to a job, a partner, a friend, or an education will meet with much disappointment later on as our enthusiasm and passion for our choice begin to fizzle. Settling for less than what our inner self is telling us leads to chronic low self-esteem, failed careers, marriages, and health. On the other hand, high self-esteem results from stretching ourselves to reach the potential that our inner self shows us through its images and words. When I doubt my ability to make these dreams real, I turn off my creative energy and feel helpless, deprived, and unable to make a decision. When we are unable to make up our mind about some decision in our lives, however large or small, we fall into self-doubt, and self-doubt is the seedling of fear. To gather our courage during this change, to just do something, we may quiet our mind and ask for guidance, flip a coin, look at our choices logically, emotionally, or consult an oracle. We need to keep ourselves in the creative flow of life to receive the answers we need. Now that feeling of fear begins to surface when we don't have enough information to trust that we will discover everything we need to be safe along our journey. A common fear that affects most people during the process of change is the fear of poverty. It is a destructive fear as it undermines our sense of self through suffering and shame. With a fear of poverty, we worry yet become indifferent to our needs. We lack imagination and enthusiasm. Now, this fear causes us to doubt our abilities, to become overcautious, procrastinate, rationalize our failures, or envy those who have succeeded in moving through their changes. To overcome this common fear, we need to discover what memories are tied to the fear. We can choose to encourage ourselves through our inner voice to have a positive relationship with our money. When we affirm the overwhelming abundance of people, ideas, and opportunities in the world, we can be assured that if we are open to receive, the universe is there to give. Another fear that blocks our movement and growth is the fear of being criticized. When we feel this fear, we deny our initiative, diminish our imagination, become self-conscious, nervous, and limit our individual expression. If we uncover the source of our shame at being us, we reclaim our own inner strength. The courage of self-expression is essential to bring forth the unique gifts of our soul. When we've been disappointed in our relationships and careers, we may worry about the effects of the change on our health and discover that our fearful thinking is our worst disease. We can enjoy an abundance of good health if our inner thoughts and images are of health and wholeness and our daily actions support our physical and emotional health. As we find our faith in the divine healer within and acknowledge the availability of an abundance of non-medical and medical solutions, we can turn our thinking. When change affects our fear of loss of love, we become jealous, judgmental, and through our lack of control, make poor financial decisions. We cannot force or control anyone to love us. The more loving and respectful we are to honoring our dreams and ourselves, the more love we will receive in return. Many of us also fear growing old and our eventual death. These fears and worries about this chapter in our lives come from the images we collect about what we see and believe. We can choose to be connected with thoughts and pictures of spending more time enjoying the beauty of everyday life and passing over to greater peace. Charles Darwin said it wasn't the strongest or the most intelligent who survived the longest, but those who know how to change.
and research completed on people who live to be over 100 years old prove this to be the truth. Embrace your fears and live with the choices of fearless change. This is the end of Side A. Please turn the tape over now to continue listening on Side B.